Assalamu alaikum students. Hope all of you are doing very well these days. Welcome to another lecture of load bearing design. This time this will going to be walls and its types. First of all we should know what is a wall. Wall as defined by its definition it's a type of structure that defines an area, carries a load and provides shelter or security. In terms of their function, walls can be categorized into either load-bearing walls or non-load-bearing walls. First of all, what are the main features of load-bearing walls? Number one is it is a structural element. It carries the weight of a house from roof and upper floors. All the load-bearing walls transfer the load from top of the roof to the walls to the floor then again to the walls and then again to the floor and all the way to the foundation. Load bearing walls can support any type of structural members like beams, slabs and walls which are above the floor. Sometimes there is a situation that there is a wall directly above the beam. That type of wall is also called load bearing wall if it is designed to carry the vertical load. No matter we have provided the beam for taking extra load but if that particular wall is also carrying the vertical load it is also called load bearing wall. Load bearing walls apart from carrying the weight of the structure from roof till the foundations they carry their own weight as well because the material of which they are made has its own weight so they carry their own weight. Typically whenever you are designing a building with a load bearing wall these walls have to be over one and another over each floor load bearing walls can be used as interior or exterior walls usually in our houses or any kind of small building which has load bearing walls the exterior walls are always load bearing walls whereas in our houses the interior walls can also be load bearing walls except a few like there is a partition between bathroom and a dressing room there we can provide non-load bearing wall as well main features of load bearing walls are if you see in this picture this is the roof this is all wall and this is the floor so if we create a hole here in this wall the load bearing strength of the wall will be reduced. Therefore, to carry the vertical load from the roof till the foundation, we have to provide an extra support in the form of beam. We are going to provide a beam over here, right on top of the hole. And in that way, the rest of the wall along with the beam is going to act as a load carrier from roof till the foundation. You may ask, that one is such situation when we have to provide a hole in a wall. This is when we have to provide window openings or door openings in the wall. Therefore, in every door opening and window opening, we have to provide a beam over here to support that opening. Types of load bearing walls. Today we are going to learn about few of the basics load bearing walls which we use in our daily construction it's masonry wall precast concrete wall retaining walls pre-panelized load bearing metal studs wall and engineering brick wall all of these types of load bearing walls become uneconomical if the height of the building is increased because when the height of the building is increased, the load that the walls have to carry also increase. This results into the thickness of the wall and hence it provides stress on the foundation. Therefore, when high rise buildings are to be constructed, we use different type of structure to carry the load from the rooftop till the foundation of the building which becomes more economical in case of high-rise buildings. 
Now let's talk about the masonry walls in more detail. What are masonry walls and what are they made up of? Masonry walls are those walls that are either made of bricks or cement blocks and they are held together with the help of cement mortar as you can see. These are the bricks and all of these are held together with the help of cement mortar. The building of such wall will be rough and unfinished. So to beautify a wall, we plaster both sides of the wall with the cement plaster. Cement plaster is going to give it more smooth look and it will actually prepare the wall to be decorated with either uh, white washes, distempers or any kind of beautiful surface material like ceramics, tiles, red bricks, marble etc. Nowadays with the technology we have been able to produce cement blocks as well. Cement blocks look like this and they are actually called concrete masonry units or CMUs. They come in a variety of types. These can be solid concrete blocks or hollow concrete blocks or the most latest one is the lightweight aerated concrete blocks. The solid concrete masonry units look like this. And if we provide holes in this solid concrete block, they become hollow concrete blocks like this. This is to make the solid concrete block more lightweight. And the latest is the lightweight aerated concrete block. It looks solid like this, but if we look closer, into this material. This is the close up. It looks like this. It looks porous, just like a sponge. This kind of aerated concrete blocks, these are the most lightweight and they are precasted and looks like a formic concrete building material. It does not only provide as a structural unit for building a masonry wall but it also provides insulation against fire and mold resistance. Another two materials that we use for constructing masonry walls are furnace bricks. Furnace bricks are also called ceramic bricks and stone. Furnace bricks looks like this. These are usually used in the exterior walls of a building. Then we have another material stone. This is one of the initial stone masonry wall when the stone was not cut into cubes or not cut into particular shapes and whatever shape of the stone they used to find, they used to make a wall like this. When we do not shape the stone pieces, this kind of stone is called undressed stone. And the wall formed by the composition of undressed pieces of stone is called random rubble stone walls. This was the very initial ways in which we used to construct a wall out of stone masonry. Then we started dressing up a stone. Dressing up a stone means that we cut the stone into cuboids and smooth the faces of the stones just like this wall. This type of stone masonry walls is called ashlar masonry walls. Now let's talk about some technical details about the masonry walls. For brick walls, the common thickness that we use for constructing a building is normally 9 inches wall and for the concrete block walls, the common thicknesses that we use are 8 inches, 6 inches and 4 inches. The thickness of the wall is actually the naked wall thickness which does not include the plaster because whenever we construct a wall through brick blocks or concrete walls and joining them together with the help of cement mortar this produces a naked wall and this thickness should be of nine inches then we add plaster on both sides depending upon the type of finishing material that we wish to use on that wall that plaster adds to the actual thickness of the wall by 1 inches or 1.5 inches. So whenever we design a plan of a building, when we draw it on the paper, we actually stating the original thickness of the naked wall, 9 inches, 
or if it's a non load bearing wall then 4.5 inches or if it's a heavy load bearing wall then 13 and a half inches or 15 inches that wall does not include the extra layer of plaster on both sides so the actual building will have a space one inches or 1.5 inches less on each wall the problem with the masonry walls is that that they cannot be constructed to an unlimited height as mentioned earlier that masonry walls which are load bearing walls they are not meant to be used for high rise buildings these masonry walls are stable only up to a height of 10 feet or maximum 15 feet. And if you wish to construct a masonry wall higher than that height, which is maximum 15 feet, then we have to design a special wall and we have to provide an intermediate structural members like beams, etc. to support the wall. In that case, the wall will still remain as a load bearing wall, but it will have an extra strength given by the beam. Another major problem with the masonry walls is that, as mentioned before, that load bearing walls carry their own weight as well. So these masonry walls mainly rely on their own weight to keep them into the place. We have to put the cement mortar and each block or the brick needs to be strongly connected with one another. But in actual, in practical, these blocks of bricks or cement, they are, they have a very loose connection with one another because the only medium of connection that we are providing between one block and another is a very thin layer of mortar. Therefore, this is the reason that they do not perform well in earthquakes when the entire building is horizontally shaken. These masonry walls oftenly collapse during earthquakes. Apart from these two disadvantages that we have just learned, the masonry wall has a pro that the material we use, such as bricks and stones, they can increase the thermal mass of a building. Overall, the masonry walls is a product of non-combustible material and it can protect the building from fire. Let's move on to another load bearing wall, which is precast concrete wall. What is a precast concrete? This is a concrete that we cast in a reusable mold and then we cure it in the factory with a controlled environment. This type of controlled environment provides us 100% perfect curing of the concrete, which is necessary for the concrete to gain its strength. Once the concrete is completely cured, it is then taken out of the molds and transported to the construction site. And then we use some kind of cranes to lift that into place. You can see in this picture, this is a whole wall which has some wall openings in it as well. Probably the window openings. This wall block is lifted up and going to fit it over here. The minimum thickness of these precast wall panels is 4.9 inches when these are reinforced. If the precast concrete is not reinforced, thickness of the panel can increase. Reinforcement provides extra strength to, to the concrete because the strength of steel is further added to the strength of concrete. For the panels where the panel thickness is 7 inches, there is a central layer mesh like this and then Two layers of concrete are used, one above and one underneath that mesh. These kind of precast concrete wall panels are durable and moisture resistant and they provide a very good insulation against fire and sound. Therefore, you do not have to provide an extra layer of insulation in your building if it's not required in particularly. One of the very big advantage of precast concrete walls are that these Precast elements are manufactured in a factory where there is a controlled environment for casting the concrete. Because of the controlled environment, it is easier for the engineers to control the mix, to place it in the reusable mold and then 
cure it. As you already know, if the concrete is not cured for 28 days accurately, it's not going to gain its strength. So this is one of the biggest advantage of having a precast concrete wall in terms of its strength. The use of precast concrete wall also makes the building work quicker. The quick construction of the building will actually decrease the time allocated for building, which will ultimately reduce the cost of the building in terms of time. Our next load bearing wall is retaining walls. A retaining wall is a kind of a rigid wall that we use to support soil horizontally. These are the wall designed and constructed to support soil at a slope steeper that can naturally be supported. For example, you may have seen these kind of walls while going through motorway. These are basically the hilly areas. This is the road perpendicular to the hill. To avoid the soil that we have here to fall over this road, we actually provide retaining walls. These retaining walls are going to support the soil at a slope which is steeper than its natural Retaining walls not only provide lateral support to the soil, but they also have an environmental benefits like reducing erosion and protecting areas from being saturated. There's a term that we use, breast wall. This is a wall that we build to sustain the face of the natural bank of the earth. This breast wall is also the same as retaining wall. There are a few types of retaining walls like gravity walls, cantilever retaining walls, sheet pile retaining walls, counter fort retaining walls and buttressed walls. We are going to study all of these in detail in another lecture. Next one is pre-panelized load bearing metal stud walls. As you can see from these pictures that this wall is composed of metal frame and it is mostly used as a building exterior wall cladding. This frame can be made up of any metal like stainless steel, copper or aluminium. And one of the biggest advantage of this kind of frame is that it supports the gravity, seismic and wind loading. These pre-panelized load bearing metal stud walls are also manufactured in the factory. Whenever we start a project, we give specifications regarding that particular project to the manufacturers and the manufacturers make sure that all the metal sections is of good quality and really precise to the specification that has been given to them. Otherwise, the specification and the quality of the metal wall is not taken into consideration. These prefabricated wall panels will not fit on site. It's all about the load bearing walls. We have messed a uh, material engineering brick wall uh, in the masonry walls, which I'm going to cover now. The buildings in which we need more strength and where we need to have low water absorption, we use these engineering bricks. These engineering bricks are such made that they have holes in them as shown here in the picture. And these holes actually allow the brick to heat evenly. So even heat absorption means that when they are going to dry in the furnace, that drying and firing process will be even. These engineering bricks have high compressive strength and low water absorption. Low water absorption means that they can be used as a damp proof course. The standard size of the engineering brick is slightly different from the standard normal regular brick that we use. The standard size for an engineering brick is 4 inches by 3.2 inches by 8 inches. These bricks are made using a mold. Let's now move on to the non-load bearing walls and their main features. So non-load bearing walls, as the name suggests, they do not support the load from the roof or floor, etc. They do not carry the load from the roof till the foundations. These non-load bearing walls are not part of the structural frame system. Whenever we are using a high rise building, we mostly use column and beam structure in which the load is being carried by the beams and columns and then to the foundation. In that case, all the interior walls which actually divide the floor space to make uh, smaller rooms, all of those walls are non-load bearing walls and also called partition walls. These non-load bearing walls, as they do not carry the load of the building 
These are lighter and they actually reduce the dead load of the structure. The load bearing walls, if we remove them from the structure, the structure may collapse because these are the walls carrying the load of the structure. But if we remove any kind of non-load bearing wall, there is no danger to the safety of the building. The building is not going to collapse at all. Especially in high-rise building where the column and beam structure is being used, these non-load bearing walls act a very cost-effective solution to divide the floor into smaller spaces. So first wall is the partition wall that comes into a non-load bearing walls. Non-load bearing partition wall always form the interior of a building. As seen in this picture, all the walls which are on the exterior side are of larger thickness as compared to the walls which are on the interior side. These ex exterior walls are all load bearing walls and these interior walls are non-load bearing walls. These interior non-load bearing walls termed as partition walls are designed to divide a larger space into a smaller space. For example, in this plan, there is this big space having a kitchen and a lounge and a diner all together. By providing this thin line, we are indicating that this is the partition wall which is dividing this lounge and diner hall into two different spaces. It depends on the use of the space that uh, what would be the height of the partition wall. It um, varies. It can be from uh, ceiling to floor or it can be from floor till uh, mid height. These walls are made up of glass, fiberboards or brick masonry. Usually it's a frame construction. We secure the partition wall either to the floor level or to the roof or to the uh, wall. Partition walls are strong enough to carry their own weight and they are good in resisting the impact as well. That is why we can attach and support small wall fixtures with these partition walls. These partition walls will be strong enough to support the wall fixtures and stay stable. Light partition walls. Light partition walls do come into the main category of partition walls. The only difference is that these light partition walls have dry masonry. In normal partition walls, the walls can be made up of brick masonry or uh, hollow concrete blocks. But in case of light partition walls, the material is always light so that the construction is quick and does not include any kind of wet and they do not use any kind of cement mortar or water in their construction. Light partition walls are also called dry wall partitions. They are always very quick to construct and they cause minimal disturbance. As these partition walls are light and quick to construct, they are not supposed to be always on the pre-planned beam. They can rest anywhere on the floor plan. These kind of light partition walls allow us for greater flexibility in layouts. Whereas when we talk about the heavy masonry walls, they have to be resting on the pre-planned beams and we cannot move them anywhere we want. Therefore, light partition walls are clearly a non-structural element in nature. Light partition walls just like this are, we have to construct a building frame first and then we cover that frame with the help of sheets or boards. And this is the frame that we have to construct first. This frame can be either made up of galvanized steel sections or we can also use wood here. And the gap between these two members of the frame, we use glass over here or maybe cover it with sheets and boards. Here we can also add insulating material if we wish to. If there is a particular condition where the insulation of the material is required, then that insulation material can be filled over here. Otherwise, we can leave that as it is. Another example of known load bearing walls is panel walls. These walls are generally made up of wood and are used as an exterior non-load bearing wall in a framed construction. These are used to 
increase the aesthetic appearance of the building both from inside and outside. Construction wise, they need to be supported at each story, but they are very light in weight, therefore they are subjected to lateral loads. That means that even a very small wind load can actually damage these panel walls. These panels are installed with the help of nails or adhesives or we can use both nails and adhesive. Veneered walls. Masonry veneer wall is a single non-structural external masonry wall. This one which is usually made up of brick stone or dressed manufactured stone. It has an mm -hmm. airspace behind this airspace and this brick veneer is anchored to the main masonry load bearing wall. Here the main masonry load bearing wall is CME which is concrete masonry unit. So this concrete masonry unit acts as a backing. This wall, this side will face the interior of the building and this side which is the brick veneer is going to face the exterior of the building. This type of veneer is called anchored veneer. The famous one is made up of brick and uh, it came into use when the insulation for buildings became mandatory in some areas. Brick veneers are always uh, lightweight and they take very less time to construct. If you look at this picture, this is the brick veneer, then we have an airspace, then here is this thing is the anchor which is connecting the exterior wall with the interior wall or veneer wall with the backing wall. At the end we have a flashing and a weep hole. Flashing is designed to collect and divert any kind of moisture which will penetrate the wall from up here. This flashing material can be either metal or plastic. All the water that will penetrate here is going to collect in this flashing and will come out of the wall through this weep hole. Next is curtain wall. Curtain wall is a non-structural cladding system for the external walls of the building. As you can see in the pictures, these buildings are actually constructed on column beam structure and the load is carried by the column beams. And these cladding acting as the curtain wall are non-structural wall. Dwarf wall. As the term dwarf refers to a low wall that we often use as a garden wall, fence or as the base of the conservatory of both structure as you can see this is a con conservatory. This wall up till here is the dwarf wall and then there are windows. Generally, this term can be applied to any wall that is less than one story high, like eight, less than eight feet high. But typically, uh, this term is used for the walls which are less than a meter. Rain screen wall. This wall comprises an outer skin of panels and an airtight insulation, which is backed by a wall this structural walls and separated by a ventilated cavity. Some water may penetrate into the cavity but the rain screen is intended to provide protection from direct rain. As you can see in this picture, this is the exterior cladding and this space and this space is left for the ventilation purpose. This exterior cladding is attached with the insulation with the help of these anchors. Then we have an insulation and an air barrier. And then all of this thing is attached to the structural wall at the back. This structural wall is going to face the interior of the building and this exterior cladding of rain screen is going to face the exterior. Some of the rain water can come inside here 
but this rain screen cladding purpose is to avoid the direct rain coming into the interior of the building. These type of rain screens are used in those areas where there is rain showers almost throughout the year. This cross section is of the same image. These blue panels are the rain screen panels and this air barrier ventilation cavity is this one which eliminates the remainder of the moisture by natural drainage and evaporation. Next is Trum Wall. Trum Wall is a passive solar building design where a wall is built on the winter sun side. Here is the sun and this wall, Trum Wall is facing the winter sun side of a building with a glass external layer, this one, and a high heat capacity internal layer separated by a layer of air. So this is the Trum Wall. It has this there this black one internal layer which has the tendency to absorb high heat so it's a high heat capacity layer then we have an air cavity this one and the layer which is facing the exterior is the glass panel so that the glass can actually invite the sunlight into the room once the sunlight enters the room, it is all the heat is actually absorbed by this layer and retained by this room wall. This is the interior of the room. The cool air in the room is going to come down as it's high weight. Once it passes through this room wall, because of the heat that is being retained by this internal layer it is going to get warm and as you know that warm air rise up it is going to rise up and then again will go into the room this is how the storm pool works it is used in those countries where it's too cold like canada and where we wish to use the passive solar building design now we are going to talk about some types of poles that are actually categorized based upon their design. They can be part of a load bearing wall or a non load bearing wall. First wall is similar to a veneered wall except that the load bearing masonry unit is in the center and there are two different materials that can be used for the interior facing and for the exterior facing of the wall. The two facing interior and exterior one, they can be of similar material as well, but where the appearance of the interior is different than the appearance of the exterior or where the function of both the interior and exterior is different there, we can use different materials. For example, this is the exterior wall and here we have used brick attached to this common central material concrete or it can be a CMU and then on the interior side we have used this fiber board for the aesthetic appearance. This fiber board is also attached to this central common material which is concrete. This gives it a very streamlined look and this face wall is very easy to install. The two different surfaces interior and exterior one once they are joined with the common central material concrete in this case the whole of the wall starts acting like one wall so all of these two different materials bonded with the central material together to ensure that there is a common action under load this is also what makes it different from the veneer wall because veneer wall is not attached with the backing but it is anchored together therefore the veneer wall acts as a non-structural wall the last one is the cavity walls the cavity walls consist of two layers both of these layers are made of masonry and these two walls are known as internal lead and external lead for instance in this picture this is the outer wall or external lead and this is the internal wall or 
internal leaf and here in between these two holes there is a cavity which acts as an insulation. This cavity wall is also known as hollow wall. Cavity wall gives better thermal insulation than any other solid wall because this space is full of air and air reduces heat transmission. They have a heat flow rate that is 50% less than that of a solid wall. It is economically cheaper than other solid walls and it is also fire resistant. That is all about the walls and its types. Hope these walls were interesting and easy for you to understand. See you in the next lecture.